Hey everybody, this is Doug Kenny from Relentless and Unstoppable. 25 years ago, uh, we had the Columbine tragedy in my home state of Colorado, and it was a very unfortunate deal. And today we have one of the survivors with us, Lauren Cartaya. How you doing? Hi, good. Thanks. How are you? Doing fabulous. So, so yeah, everyone. This is one of the very few episodes of R&U that either doesn't have a happy ending or for some doesn't entirely have a happy ending. And we need to spread awareness that there's still darkness in this world, even though we're all about positivity. So that's why we have Lauren on with us today. Yeah. So how are you doing today, Lauren? I'm doing pretty well. Not really thinking about um, a lot of the tragedy, more of how I can better myself, better my community. Um, We call it the kind of day to give. Um, We were supposed to have softball, but of course, every April 20th for, I don't, probably the last 25 years it snowed. So (laughs) just falling into line, it snows today. And so there's no softball. So um, my girls aren't doing anything for anymore for the day of service, but um, I'm going to be volunteering at a um, firefighter and uh, police boxing match this evening and just giving my time back and trying to make the best out of a bad situation. Yeah, for sure. You know, that was really unfortunate. You know, it's this is an example of what can happen, you know, when when people have hate against the world, you know, and they and how in the end it can destroy them and take people with them, sadly, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Hate is bad. It's really bad. And unfortunately, it's never going to go away, I don't think. No. Nah. Yeah. So where are you originally from? I am a native of Colorado. I'm from Littleton. I grew up in Governor's Ranch, which is just a small subdivision in Littleton. Um, And I have never left Littleton. I still live in Littleton. Um, I actually live less than a mile away from Columbine now. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. I went to Littleton all the time when I was younger, when I lived up there. It's a pretty nice town. Where exactly are you from? I'm from Estes Park originally. Oh, okay. Okay. I didn't realize you were up there. Okay. Yeah. And we always uh, signed Rachel's challenge every year when I was in middle school and elementary school and all that. Although we were made, we were not really made aware of what it was until we got older, obviously. Right. Yeah. You know, with having kids, my kids are a little bit older. You know, I have one that's, um, will be graduating high school next year. Um, one that will be a sophomore next year and then a uh, third grader. And um, out of all of my friends, my kids are the oldest. And they were kind of wondering, like, when do you start telling your kids in, about any of it? And, you know, Rachel's challenge in the Scott family is they are wonderful people. Really, they are. But, um, you know, there's never a good time. And it's just kind of you just got to teach them that, yes, this is part of the day and this is what goes on and it could happen. But we're learning from these mistakes and trying to move forward. And, yeah, it's just it's hard with having children. It's a different story. Yeah, I remember when I was first asked to sign it, I was in fifth grade and I was wondering what it was about. And I was told by the teachers, it's complicated. You'll understand when you get older, you know. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. And then the, on the 10th anniversary, uh, the brother of Rachel Scott came to speak at our school. And that's when I had an idea of what had happened. That's when I learned about the whole deal. And I, I thought it was really sad. It is very sad. And Craig is such a good human. He's the, he truly embodies the idea of giving back. He, he really does. He, his whole family really does. Yeah, and I learned from him that he learned a hard lesson that day to not, he learned a lesson from what he said to treat every day like it's your last, because before the massacre, he had a argument with his sister, and from what he said, and and he did not know what was going to happen minutes later, you know. Terrible, yeah, and it is, it is a good lesson, and it's so sad that all of us had to learn it that way. Yeah, yeah, for sure, you know. It's really unfortunate, but yeah. So before the tragedy at Columbine, what was your upbringing like? I had a very, we'll say quote unquote with air quotes, um, normal 
upbringing, very happy life. My dad was a petroleum engineer. Uh, my mom was a stay at home mom. Um, she started working like, I don't know, maybe when I was like in fifth grade or something like that. So really she was home pretty much my entire life. And then when we were at Columbine, she ended up being there just like partial part-time working kind of thing. And um, she happened to be at work that day and she was, that's when she quit her job was that day. Cause she was like, I have to be at home cause she was too far away. So it just, it, it, the upbringing part was, there was no such thing as a bad day for me. Yeah, for sure. As in, you know, that's one of the things about life is, you know, sometimes when you take things for granted, life will throw a curveball at you to remind you that there's darkness in it. So, um, how did you end up going to Columbine to begin with? So that was just, it happened to just be the feeder school that my neighborhood school uh, or my neighborhood fed into. Um, at I think I want to say like within maybe two years of April or of 29 or 1999, they had opened Dakota Ridge High School, which was like another uh, high school in the area. So then there would be three feeder schools. And I just was going where all my friends were planning to go who had already had, you know, older siblings there. And my brother was already there. So we just kind of had to go there pretty much. And I chose to really, I mean, we could have, I could have opened and rolled at Dakota Ridge at the other school, but I didn't. Yeah. I read in school growing up that the Columbine is the state flower for Colorado. And so that's where, that's where a lot of Columbine high school holds significance to Colorado pretty much from what I've read. Yes. Yep. And it's funny because if you look at a Columbine, have you ever grown Columbines? I saw many of them when I was in Colorado, but I've never grown them now. So when I first met my husband, he knew that I was a survivor. And one of the very first gifts he gave me was a Columbine plant. And we planted it in our front yard and they seed like really easily. So when the wind blows, it would seed all over the place and they almost just pop up like weeds. Well, I thought they grew back like the same color every year they would be the purple every year well now I have three that grow back different colors every year it's really weird but they are beautiful beautiful plants in the end when they actually bloom and they grow and they're open and they are very pretty yeah have you ever heard the song where the columbines grow no I was introduced to that song in fourth grade by uh, my teacher Trisha Wynn <laughs> I need to write that down yeah, it was a bike. good song. And we sang it in music class when I was. Funny. With... Yeah. Read that down. So, yeah. Did you know Dylan and Eric before that whole massacre happened or no? Uh, not by name. No, I didn't. Yeah, did... did you see them my... around campus? Yes. Yeah. They, I mean, the, the school was big. Yes. They, we had a lot of students and everything, but they were, um, uh, how do you, I, I guess easier to spot. They, they kind of, it was just kind of like if the football team got together and put on all their letterman's jackets, same kind of thing. Those guys would all get together, put on their trench coats and, you know, it was a group. It was a, their little click. And I mean, yeah, you knew who they were, but you didn't, I wasn't to the point where I thought that that would happen. Hmm. If that makes sense. I didn't, I didn't think that that would happen. Um, but so. there were people that I, I could tell you, I, there are times even to this day, I remember they would walk by and they made a very large presence just because they were not small human beings. They made sure that they were big. And when they would walk by, I remember grabbing onto friends and being like, Ooh, scary you know but I didn't know who they were and never was like ew you know I would never point out to them that I was afraid of them or thought they were scary or anything like that I just remember feeling like that so your first impression of them was basically that that they looked a little intimidating but you weren't aware that they were dangerous yeah I would say that's probably true I have to say too when going back to the whole up upbringing I was very sheltered and I, I say that like proudly, but also somewhat ashamed. Um, but, uh, you know, I was, I was brought up so sheltered that 
in my world, nothing like that could happen. So yeah, I mean, it, this person could have walked by me in the mall and I probably still would have been scared because of my upbringing. My parents kept me very sheltered, very, everything was very Disney oriented, you know, there's never a, a sad time in my life. So I think anytime somebody like that, that made such a big presence in front of me, I would have been scared of anyways.